All right, folks, I'm sure you enjoyed um, that inspiring narrative from um, uh, Sandy on the wonderful things that they're doing at um, Amazon. Uh, next, we're going to move on to a topic that uh, a lot of people would consider uncomfortable, but needs to be talked about. Um, violence against Asian Americans and Asians has grown despite increased national attention and political action against anti-Asian hate. Reported hate crimes against Asians in 16 of the nation's largest cities and countries are up by 164% since this time last year according to a new study from the Center for Hate, uh, Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State University, uh, San Bernardino. Our next two speakers will exemplify the concept of courageous communication and discuss how to address anti-Asian racism in society and at work. Tina Shah Paikhede leads Russell Reynolds Global Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Services as a senior member of the leadership and succession team. Her recent work has included the recruitment of chief diversity officers, the development of inclusive leaders and inclusive culture transformation. Based in San Francisco, she advises public, private and nonprofit clients around the world. Anna Mark is the president and co-founder of Ascend, North America's membership network of pan-Asian business professionals and the co-founder of Ascend Pinnacle, North America's network of Pan-Asian corporate directors. Known as a community builder and connector, Anna has a deep passion for creating economic and educational access and for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace and society. Tina and Anna, thank you so much for joining us here today. And I'll turn the stage over to you. Thank you, Rajni. It's a pleasure to be here at the Thai Annual Conference. And Thank you for having us. Um, it's a delight, Anna, to be joining you on the stage for this very, very important topic. And so thank you for joining us uh, to have a brief conversation about it. You know, as Regine mentioned, there's been, you know, so much um, racism that's been experienced by the Asian community in the wake of the pandemic, and especially recently leading to the shooting deaths of six Asian American women in Atlanta, the stabbings of two elderly, Asian women in San Francisco just this week. Um, and between March 19th, 2020 and the end of February of 2021, there were 4,000 incidents of hate from physical to verbal assault and 700 of those happening in the Bay Area. It really reminds me of the aftermath of 9-11 when hate crimes were targeting South Asians um, in particular and brown people more broadly. And, you know, would love to have a conversation with you about how business leaders are standing up to speak out against the discrimination with this open letter to the Wall Street Journal, written by David Liu, managing partner of the AAPI Connecting Hyphen Capital, and signed by thousands of Asian CEOs, board members, other business leaders and allies, signatories, including Tony Zhu of DoorDash, Kenneth Lin of Credit Karma, Eric Yoon, uh, of Zoom, Debbie Sue of OpenTable, Deb Liu of Ancestry.com, they're raising millions because they no longer feel it's right to remain silent in our country, which really was formed of immigrants. And so as we think about that, Anna, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about um, your background. When did you move to the U.S. or were you born here and how has uh, your culture shaped your work as a leader? First, I want to thank you, Tina and Russell Reynolds and Ty for really hosting this conversation. It is so important for us to find our voices and talk about race as Asians. That is not inherent in the way maybe many of us were raised, whether you were raised in Asia or the U.S. So my journey is my family moved here when I was a baby, here meaning the Bay Area, uh, just across the bridge from you, Tina. And uh, so I grew up largely, I would say, as an Asian American, yet I had immigrant parents who didn't speak English. So in my household, I grew up very Chinese and very Asian. I use this analogy of I grew up watching Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island. So probably for those of you old enough to watch those shows, you can probably guess my age. But I grew up doing that using chopsticks and still use chopsticks today. So meaning there's a piece of me that's very Americanized, but there's also a piece of me that's inherently Asian. 
and how I show up in my preferences and then how I behave. Um, and so that's very much me. And I've used that and really had these multiple facets of me as I've developed my own career within Deloitte and as I've done my community work. Uh, you mentioned the signing and Asians uh, really coming together for a common cause. And I do think this is our moment to create a movement. And that moment to create a movement is to say that as Asians, we're no longer going to be the quiet, just the quiet and the hardworking Asians that will accept some of the racism or acts of bias that many of us have confronted for a long time, yet we didn't really talk about them because we were always this very good minority and the model minority. And that model minority is actually true for us as a broader Asian American community, not just for Chinese, not just for Koreans, but including for South Asians and people of Indian descent too. I'm glad that you raised that. I mean, I think that um, business leaders are speaking up, right? Because I think the perceived characteristics of Asians as leaders has been quiet, hardworking, self-sacrificing, and perhaps at times perceived not to be ambitious or to command the soft skills uh, to command authority. And so past efforts are focused on adapting leadership styles, but then Asians tend to face this double-edged sword of sort of culturally mismatched expectations. And I'm curious, as you think about, um, you know, the, the cliches that you often hear of loud duck gets shot in Asia versus squeaky wheel gets the grease in America. How have you been able to navigate authenticity versus assimilation as an Asian American business leader? It's something I have to work on every day, every day. I have to decide, am I gonna be uh, the super loud person in the room? Which is actually not natural to me to do that. And I have to decide when I'm gonna challenge someone and do it in a way that's comfortable for me because I was raised to respect authority and respect hierarchy because that's how it is in our families, right? We respect our parents, we respect systems. And that's a bit of what we're raised to do. But it is a journey that I myself am on. But also the other thing that I've really tried to do a lot more is challenge these systems, right? Challenge the norm, ask the question, does a leader have to be the loudest person in the room? I don't think so, right? Especially when you look at it in a global context. So we have these views of leadership that I think sometimes are a bit dated now when we look at the younger generation, when we look at the global workforce. And so there's a lot of opportunities for all of us to really challenge what does a leader look like and change the view of what leadership looks like. Yeah, I think in the panel earlier, they were talking about inclusion and what, you know, what does it mean to be an inclusive leader? Part of it is seeing leadership in the various forms that it shows up. And in fact, you know, we've done a study at Russell Reynolds on leaders from um, Asia, from China, India, and the U.S. in particular, who are CEOs. And we found some significant cultural differences at play. Um, for example, right, um, those in India and China scored higher on power distance than the U.S., which scores low on power distance because of the differential preference, preference for hierarchy. The U.S. not surprisingly scores high on individualism, whereas India and China scored lower. Again, uh, really showing that differential preference for the individual versus group. And I think these cultural differences really show up in leadership styles where U.S. leaders might be more connecting and vulnerable at the same time of having loud characteristics, while Asian leaders uh, show up perhaps as more practical and reluctant if we're thinking about generalizing, which is always you know, um, hard to do, but I think that, you know, recognizing different leadership styles and how they show up is really important. As we think about, um, you know, Thai and enabling entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, if you will, and I would love to hear your perspective on the research that Ascend has done in corporate America and your thoughts on whether entrepreneurship has been a successful path for East and, and South Asians in particular, and whether corporations are missing out on some good talent. I think it's not a, 
how do I say, I don't think it's always an or. So I know Thai is definitely an organization and there's a lot of Asians, right? That choose to leave larger corporate, corporate organizations to go and start companies. And I would hope that they're not leaving because they don't think the opportunities are there in the companies and the ability to make change. So I think it's important for us to remember, you can make change in any platform, big company, small company. Now, there's a lot of reasons, again, people go and start their companies. And I encourage that, right? There's entrepreneurship is so important to us around the world, but definitely uh, in the U.S. Uh, And so I would say if you're a member of Thai and you're a leader, I would also ask you to be a very inclusive leader, right? As you think about recognizing your own workforce and show that you can change what a leader looks like within your company and model it differently. And hopefully that can lead to bigger companies having a different style of leadership and vice versa. I love that. I love that role modeling, what uh, different styles of leadership looks like. I think we are almost out of time here and Rajni, I will um, turn it back to you to see if we have time for questions from the audience or if we need to wrap up here. Hi, Tina. Um, Tina and Anna, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, There are a lot of questions, but we are kind of running out of time. Um, You know, but I'm just glad that we are beginning to have these kind of conversations, right? Because, and as you mentioned, you know, this is not something that we've been, we've been raised to not talk about, you know, things like this. And we are bucking the trend now, which I think is an extremely important thing to do. uh, Because when we talk about things, then we acknowledge Uh, the problems, the challenges, the issues. And that's the first step towards putting together remedies to make sure that we go towards a more inclusive world. So um, again, you know, I truly, truly, truly appreciate both of you uh, for taking the time to join us at the Diversity and Inclusion Panel here at TICON 2021 and for getting us started on this dialogue. And I'm hoping that you have inspired all the you know, 28,000 people that are um, that are on Tycon right now uh, to um, take a leaf out of your books, right? To start having these conversations and to start implementing change at a micro level, because that's the only way we can get this to really grow into a big movement. Thank you again, ladies.